Okay. So, uh, back to the, uh, the fourth quarter uh, mutual fund performance review. I'm going to be covering equity funds again. Again, my name is Tom Rosine. And I always start off with this slide. It's a really busy slide. Fourth quarter at a glance. And I'm not going to go through each and every one of them. I'm going to kind of summarize some of the issues that we found. Uh, three important topics came up, and I, everybody's been reading about them, so it's uh, almost a redundancy to, to tell you guys about them. But obviously, oil and commodities were a big game changer. Uh, in uh, the quarter, uh, we also had the central bank intervention, whether it be the uh, 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 People's Bank of China or whether it would be the ECB, uh, basically cutting rates and, of course, our uh, central bank uh, raising rates. Uh, big issues there. And, of course, global concerns, whether it be China, Russia, Syria, or even North Korea was in the games and really was a game changer. Uh, basically, we saw, you know, uh, some... Uh, be weaker than expected uh, non-farm payroll uh, reports uh, uh, in October, and people originally thought in October that that was going to uh, bode well for the Fed not raising interest rates. So it's one of these on and off again type of situations. But 97% of the universe on the equity and mixed asset funds actually post plus I returns about a 6.34%. And then we, uh, you know, got some news that the P People's Bank of China and ECB both uh, had uh, some uh, interest rate cuts that they were going to apply. Actually, uh, the ECB actually cut rates in in November. Uh, uh, but uh, they also, it, it was really small and people were a little discouraged, but they also uh, said, hey, listen, you know, we will do whatever it takes to combat inflation. Um, so they came out and said that. But that was a little bit discouraging uh, that they had, uh, you know, the, the Fed, you know, encouraging uh, the idea that they were going to cut rates. And then equally, the ECB was going to combat inflation. So there was concerns out there. But the biggest issue in November was the continued slide in oil and the impact it had on uh, emerging markets. Certainly, that will be a play, uh, something we talk about for, for quite some time. Uh, we had a negative performance for the average mutual fund down 0.11 percent, I should say, average equity fund, with only about 48 percent of the population of equity and mixed asset funds posting plus high returns. But if you look here, uh, on here, the Dow was up, the uh, NASDAQ was up, the S&P 500 were up, but just barely. Uh, the big players, the big winners were uh, the uh, DAX, the German DAX uh, up 4.90 percent and Nikkei up 3.48. This is a story that I'm going to be talking about as well. It's developed markets doing better, emerging markets starting to, you know, starting to sl uh, slack and not doing as well. Uh, we had uh, uh, commodity specialty funds up 3.44%, financial services funds up 3.01%, and of course the laggards. This is the story that I want to be telling you about. It'll continue on through the rest of the presentation. We had commodity precious metals down, uh, precious metal mutual funds down 8.48%, and then energy master limited partnerships down 8.26%. So anybody that was related to natural resources, oil, or even other commodities really were taken on the chin uh, starting in November and going into December as well. Uh, but finally, uh, the Fed did us a favor and finally, you know, raised interest rates. I say that, you know, it's uh, the first time they had interest rates uh, uh, increases in almost 10 years, and it certainly was a change of pace. And uh, even though we had oil on the decline and it weighed heavily on natural resources and stocks that were engaged with the highly leveraged uh, natural resources energy group, uh, so we saw financial services taken on the chin, but really at the bottom of the uh, bottom of the group for that uh, that uh, month was natural resources down 10.74%. Energy Master Limited Partnerships down 8.76%, and the big winner, of course, when we have a, a you know a blowout in the market. And by the way, it wasn't all that bad of a blowout. 3.9% uh, up on the dedicated short bias funds, and the commodity uh, basic metals or base metals was up 3.23%. So a little bit of change of pace there. Let's go ahead and move on to the kind of play by play uh, as we move into the the, the uh, fourth quarter. Basically, we had slowing global economy a plunge in oil prices, Fed hikes, and at the very end, the Chicago PMI showed a contraction. This weighed on markets quite considerably. However, everybody's talking about the doldrums that went on. We had a positive return. Uh, basically, equity funds rose 3.40% in the Q4. It's the third quarter and four that, that we actually had plus side returns. And so how it broke out is USD funds uh, actually gained favor. And so we, people focused really on large cap issues. They wanted to go after safety. They ducked a little bit from cover from uh, world equity funds. We'll see actually they did very well as well, up 3.30%. Uh, but again, investors were more into the bigger plays now, into the large caps, uh, into the S&P 500 and those type of issues. 86% of all uh, equity and mixed asset funds were in the black. It was 81 out of 96 classifications on the equity and mixed asset sides that showed 
plus side performance. So actually, it was a pretty good quarter overall. However, as the story continues on, we saw that there was a decline, a huge declines in December, as I showed, actually only about 3 or 4%, but it, it was enough to wipe out any positive gains. So on the year, uh, for the first year in four, we saw a, a downside performance for the average equity fund down 3.47% with sector equity funds really dragging down the overall average day. They were down 7.82%. We'll actually have more detail on that. Interesting enough, we saw the you know big slide in oil, and I think that was the story, along with a strengthening dollar, which makes sense. You get this strengthening dollar out there, and then also you have this slide in the commodity prices, and again, it sent kind of the, the markets on, on, on its ear, so to speak. Um, oil finished uh, down. Uh, it closed the year out at 37 uh, uh, and four cents uh, per barrel, which is really, really low. I don't think anybody expected it underneath four, uh, 40. Jeff and I were certainly talking about the days when they were over 100, and now we're talking about maybe hitting the 20s. Uh, it's just quite amazing what's happened in, in that group. Let's go ahead and talk about the United States Diversified Equity Funds group as a whole. It was the number one performing macro group for the quarter. Uh, it posted a 3.99%, and even though investors had this wary eye on the Fed and oil and global growth, they really decided to focus on the large and growth-oriented issue and really away from these highly leveraged uh, uh, energy-related uh, uh, firms. So as I told you before, large cap growth fund up 7.51%, S&P 500 funds up 6.8%, uh, and th at the bottom of the barrel, and by, by the way, you know one of the few negatives that are on here, you'll be able to see this in the big slide I showed you in a second, but dedicated short bias is down for the quarter, 9.07%, and uh, the alternatives classification equity market neutral down 6.29%. So that was kind of a story. Now we get to the fourth quarter, and we see that they are the fourth worst performing group, uh, and dedicated short bias funds led 3.9% equity market neutral back to the top. But really, after we get down to it, and we look at the one-year returns, only down 2.10%, uh, and in fact, if you were in these large caps I was talking about, large cap growth funds for the year was up 5.26%, while small cap value funds were down 7.01%. So we can obviously see investors having a preference throughout the year going after big, stable names. This actually plays into my developed markets comment, as well as doing better than, let's say, emerging markets or other areas as well, sector-focused groups. Let's go ahead and take a look at our our uh, next slide, and basically, this is just giving you the review I was just telling you about. We saw that large cap funds, well known names, you know, kind of, I'm going to call it the dividend payers, but not the value oriented dividend. It was the kind of the steady Freddy's big guys. Uh, they are the ones that actually had the best, strongest return for the quarter. Large cap growth funds at the top, SP 500, equity leverage, large cap core, all doing very well, with dedicated short bias and then equity market neutral actually suffering the only downside returns for the corner again down 9.07% for dedicated short bias and, and down 0.33% for equity market neutral funds. If we take a look at the four by three matrices uh, for the quarter, uh, this uh, kind of story kind of goes through, as I said, for the first quarter since t uh, Q3 2007, we see that growth uh, large cap growth funds were up 7.51%. It's the second consecutive quarter that large cap funds have actually done, uh, outperformed their, uh, their other brethren. So large cap was in favor. And of course, as I told you, growth was in favor. This is the sixth consecutive quarter that growth oriented funds have been doing well. So obviously the tech, biotechs and those have been on a pretty good run. If we take a look at our 4x3 ma matrices for the one month period, we see kind of the same pattern, although here is where all the reds came in. I told you December was not a real good month uh, for investors, real concerned about what was going on, hoping for the Santa Claus rally, and they were a little confused towards month end, and they had discouraging economic news. So really, we saw large cap funds mitigating losses better than the rest of the group, 1.92. Look at those small caps, almost down 5%. And large cap funds, I'm sorry, uh, growth funds also had a better run, uh, 2.50%, and again, this is the second consecutive month that they've shouldered out their other valuation groups as well. So that's kind of the story. Lagger, the group, small cap value. As I told you, if people were avoiding anything to do with kind of heavy leverage, anything that might have to do with energy or natural resource-related groups. As we take a look now at our sector equity funds, and this is kind of where the story was. It's housed for the top five performing classifications. That's a pretty good uh, uh, novelty to have. But also housed seven of the eight worst performing classifications. So this was Samage. We had high, you know, high tech stuff, you know, global technology, technology funds, science and technology funds, health biotechnology funds, all in the upper uh, uh, echelon, 11.717%, 8.93%, 8.41%. But look at the bottom once again. Commodity energy, that's at CME, 
down 15.85%. Energy Master Limited Partnership uh, uh, Groups down 10.03%. Uh, and then Commodity uh, General Funds down 8.63%. So anything with commodity relations really took it on the chin. The sector equity funds, 1.38% uh, was the weakest performing group of, for the quarter. Um, and it's interesting, we take a look, there was basically a tech rally as we're taking a look at it. And again, people avoiding anything to do with uh, the natural resources group. Uh, December, a little bit of change of pace. It was the third worst performing group for the month. Um, and basically, we had the natural resources, energy master, uh, EMP, EMLPs uh, funds down 8.76%, and CMEs, the commodity energy funds down 849 still staying at the bottom. But we did have uh, base, base uh, metals, uh, commodity-based metals up 3.23% and real estate funds doing a little bit better. However, for the year, obviously the worst performing group for the year, um, down 7.82%, and yeah, I don't need to tell you this, obviously plummeting oil prices played a significant role in it dragging down uh, the average for this group uh, considerably. If we take a look at the, uh, the group again uh, from the big picture, and this is more so you can see the names. I know I had a lot of abbreviations up there, so you'll be able to see you know, GTK, as G uh, Global Science and Technology is at the top. But really I'm focusing at the bottom where we're seeing natural resources, commodity precious metals, commodity-based metals, commodity general funds, energy MLPs, and commodity energy all really bringing up the rear. And remember I told you I had the top uh, three or four uh, uh, best performing uh, in the universe, but also had the you know seven of the eight worst performing at the bottom, and that is certainly seen here. So all commodity related related issues. If we get to our world equity funds, despite slowing growth in China and the surprise the surprise cut by the People Bank of China and further cuts if needed by the ECB, basically propped up the world equity funds up 3.30 percent for the quarter as you're going to see later on in the later slides they've been the the uh, acquirer of assets uh, out of all the major macro groups uh, for the year people really have flocked around the world equity funds despite some of the doldrums we've gone through recently um, se second strongest return for the group again here's where i was talking about japanese funds 8.97 percent china region funds uh, this is one of the anomalies that, that occurred because obviously the People Bank of China uh, came out and had the you know surprise uh, cut and you know they were trying to do some reform and despite some investigations into some of their trading uh, uh, entities in, in China, you know people actually saw some buying opportunities after it just got clobbered in Q3. Um, global large cap growth funds up again, uh, but at the bottom we're seeing those funds and those uh, classifications focused on commodity and commodity related issues. Uh, Latin America down 2.62 percent, uh, also a laggard for Q3. Uh, India region funds down 0.36 percent, and emerging market funds up, but only 0.54 percent. As we take a, a, a complete look, again, energy lagged. Uh, commodity was was really kind of the, the downfall of this uh, in December. Second best performing classification of the group, but we see India region funds the only plus side return of the group. Uh, they've had some uh, recent reform. Uh, talks going on, and again, they got beat up so bad that people were saying that uh, there were some good buying opportunities. Uh, but small cap, uh, international small cap growth funds and Pacific region funds were kind of the ones able to mitigate a little bit better uh, than uh, their Latin American emerging market and uh, value, growth and value uh, counterparts. Last piece, we saw that the third worst performing classification was the world equity funds, down 3.89%, but at the top, we see that uh, Japanese was at the top of class, Japanese-related funds, 12.03%. They posted for the one-year return. At the bottom, Latin American funds lost 29.71%. Taking a look at the uh, Q4 global and international 3 by 3 matrices, basically we just look at the quarter here and not the, the month of December. Basically, on the global side, as we'd expect, large caps and uh, growth were, uh, were, were of, of, of value. Uh, that's who we're, we're doing the outperformance. However, where we got the big turns in the international group was a small uh, and small mid-cap type of funds and growth-oriented funds. That stayed to be kind of a common area uh, for interest in the international market. Uh, but again, the big developed market funds, uh, those are the ones that actually acquired most of the assets throughout the year, and I think Pat will probably talk a little bit about that as well. As we go to the uh, World Equity Funds macro group, I just wanted to again show who was at the bottom, and it is those folks that had natural resources or commodities uh, related uh, uh, structures in their, in their economies that actually probably took it on the, on the chin the worst. So that brings us to our mixed asset fund group. 
And I usually include this, not because there's a lot of story in it. There's, you know, there's such a diverse uh, group here. You know, you got your mixed asset target uh, 2055 funds, which are at the top, uh, performing their mainly equities and a small amount of fixed income. And then you go to the very bottom and you see a lot of fixed income. So this is, you know, kind of that dichotomy. But certainly what I like to talk about here, uh, first of all, it's up 2.06% for the quarter, down uh, about 1.65%. Uh, for December and in 2015 they did uh, uh, mitigate losses um, right in the middle of the group uh, down 2.35 percent but as we take a look at this I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about the flows that occurred so totally uh, and this is basically all uh, funds including uh, or excluding ETFs. so this is all mutual funds and variable annuity funds uh, that I'm taking a look at through November 30th United States diversified equity funds which I told you had some of the strongest performance saw the biggest outflows 130.8 billion dollars through November 30th sector equity funds took in about 6.2 billion uh, despite having uh, the kind of cruddy returns I was just telling you about but here's where the story becomes interesting world equity funds took in 105.8 billion it's the first time they surpassed our mixed asset groups over the last several years on a, a one-year uh, attraction of assets. But mixed asset funds still were able to claim $56.9 billion in net inflows. So certainly people are still looking for that set it and forget it type of uh, product. Alternative uh, funds actually lost about 23.7. And the net for the year, again, this is uh, the kind of that special subgroup of, of equities. Uh, including, uh, again, open-end funds and variable annuities. Only $14.4 billion in net inflows for the group, but again, accounting for $56.9 billion of those inflows was mixed equity funds. Certainly an interesting piece. Well, this brings us back to kind of the final thing that I usually talk about. And it's not so much a forecast because I don't think anybody's good at forecast, but it's just identifying kind of the issues out there. I personally think we're in a correction, not a beginning of a recession. Um, there's all these issues that are out there, and I think the major issues are the China slow, slowing global growth. Uh, recently, we saw disappointing manufacturing uh, data come out of there, and basically we saw the, the circuit breakers trip because they hit the 7% level twice. One of those was from currency decline, and people are kind of concerned that they're, you know, China's going to let their, their currency fall uh, and make their goods that much more cheaper. Uh, and uh, basically, you know, if you export their recession to us, I don't know that it's possible. Our GDP growth, our GDP, uh, their GDP, port, GDP portion of our, uh, their portion of GDP for us is very small in comparison. I don't think they can really. Uh, export the recession to us. Oil uh, yesterday night uh, basically closed at $31.06, so certainly we have a slide going on there. Uh, certainly the Fed's going off and on on whether they're going to do the rate hikes uh, uh, going forward, and of course we have the central banks uh, of uh, the ECB, uh, People Bank of China, and all the rest. They're all talking about uh, cutting interest rates, so where's the offset there? Is there any free rides uh, going to go on there? And I think people are concerned about that. Obviously geopolitical concerns that are out there. Um, Recently, we saw the ISM non-manufacturing numbers drop. Uh, it came in at 55.3 for non-manufacturing, uh, but it's, and so it's still in uh, an area where we can call it a growth. But non the manufacturing group dropped to 48.2 uh, in December, and that's uh, indicating a contraction. Now, that said, I'm going to jump down to uh, the bottom portion of the slide really quick and say, listen, it may be a contraction, but if you take a look at it, Oil uh, and gas is probably one of the culprits in the manufacturing department that's causing this decline. So while this was a late, uh, you know, late month in December uh, uh, statistic that came out, I'm not sure that it's that big of a deal. And of course, mark, uh, the market's rocky start uh, in the new year is, 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 I'm not gonna say unprecedented, but certainly uh, an eye opener. Uh, through last night, uh, the S&P 500 was down 5.8%, and that was with a little positive return yesterday as well. Um, so obviously it's got investors reeling, but let me remind you that non-farm payrolls increased to 292,000. Uh, far out beating analyst expectations, I think it was around 200,000 that they came in at. Uh, the increase in volatility, by the way, often leads to opportunities for us to buy. Um, and so uh, an oversold market in some of the areas, obviously we're gonna have to be selective of what we do, uh, but certainly it's an area uh, that we can you know, t start talking to our clients about. Next, the Fed is still in an easy money area. I mean, we, we, half a percentage points, folks, this is nothing. Uh, so you know, we really have easy money out there, and I, I think that bodes well uh, for the United States going uh, forward. Uh, manufacturing, again, was probably the cause of those, uh, you know, the oil, you know, the oil declines was probably the, the cause of the manufacturing uh, ISM numbers. Uh, coming out uh, kind of cruddy, and I think we'll see a reversal there. Um, one of the things I like to talk about is the Thomson Reuters proprietary research group, and basically we saw an improvement in the uh, the uh, 
uh, kind of negative to positive ratio that they actually do. Uh, we saw a slight increase to 3.1%. To um, uh, actually declined to 3.1%. So uh, last month or last quarter was actually 3.3. Not a big improvement, but again, a slight improvement from Q3. So we are seeing a little less negative, a little more positive announcements as well. And of course, uh, if you take a look at the first 21 companies that have uh, reported earnings so far, uh, 76 have outreported uh, earnings from analyst expectations. I do want to put in the caveat, however, that if I took a look at revenues, uh, that is a very low number. I think we're in the 20s or 30s, uh, and it's below the standard. So I don't want to. I don't want to paint this too pretty. Um, certainly, uh, like I said, I, I think we're in a correction. I think there's more to come. I think there's some issues that need to be solved, but uh, certainly I think there's going to be some opportunities out there as well. So that's it for me. If you have any questions, uh, we can go ahead and take those at the end of the presentation. I'm going to turn this over to Jeff Turnhoy. Thanks.